and that we would live in light of it here on earth. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So let's begin by looking at the Greeks and the Persians, and you can find them in verses 1 to 4. And I think the best way to, to look at these verses is to remind you of two contexts. The first is a literary context. And let me explain to you what I mean. Daniel 11 doesn't just drop out of the sky. It's a part of a book. And it's in this particular part of a book and not in the earlier parts of the book. See, Daniel discusses history a lot. Daniel discusses world history a lot. In fact, Daniel has been discussing the same period of history with increasing detail ever since chapter 2. Now that's what we call progressive parallelism. Now that word might not, that phrase might not mean anything to you. But that's an important word to help you understand the Bible because guess what? There's another book that is structured exactly the same way. And that's the book of Revelation, which we're not looking at now. But I imagine if you read it later on, you can feel, you get the sense that there's a lot of similarities between Daniel and Revelation. So let's just begin by thinking about world history according to Daniel, starting at the beginning and moving down toward the end. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and God tells him about the rest of world history. He sees this image that's made of four parts that represents four kingdoms. And then he sees this rock that comes from heaven, smashes the whole thing in pieces, and then the rock becomes a mountain and covers the entire earth. Kingdoms will rise and fall. Empires will rise and fall. The kingdom of God will come, outlive, outlast, and rule over all. That's the message of chapter 2. That's world history in chapter 2. But then in chapter 7, we get more insight into that same period of time. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel, not Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream, not of an image made of four parts, but of an ocean and four beasts. And out of the ocean come four hideous beasts, which represent beastly kings that would rise and fall, culminating in one final great king, one final terrible king, one little horn, who will persecute God's people and then be destroyed by the coming of the Son of Man, who will establish a kingdom that will never be passed away, never pass away, never be given to another, that sort of thing. Right? It's the same history with greater detail. Then we come to Daniel's, Daniel 8 and 9, where the focus is on the same people and the same players in world history. We see the Persians, we see the Greeks again, we see the abominable Antiochus Epiphanes, we see Christ and we see Antichrist all over again, right? Same people, same players, same events, just greater detail. And now that we come to Daniel 11, we see the exact same thing. Same span of time, same major players, same history, but even greater detail to those events. It's textbook progressive parallelism that's the literary context and if i've lost you and you don't care about those sorts of things come back to me but we've looked at sort of the literary context now let's think about the historical context when daniel received this vision the persians were in control and they would remain in control for the next two centuries daniel mentions kings would rise and fall he says that there's a three followed by a fourth. Now, if you learn, study Persian history, you know that there were nine kings. So how does this square with that? Well, if you ever read the book of Proverbs, you'll hear oftentimes, these three things amaze me, and this fourth is overwhelming. Third, threes and then a fourth is typical in the Proverbs or in the Minor Prophets as a way of discussing, dis discussing fullness or completeness. Now, the last king is the most important in this list, and many identify him with somebody you know something about. Xerxes. Xerxes is the fourth king, the rich king in this list. You know him as Esther's husband. If you read the book of Esther. You also know him as the one who took on the Spartans at Thermopylae and got slowed down and then got beat at Salamis by a united uh, Greek front. That stopped the expansion of the Persians into Europe, changed Western history, and in a few years, Alexander would come from Macedonia, rally the Greeks, defeat the Persians, and establish an even greater empire. But at the height of his power, he would go down. We've talked about that before. He had no children. His king was divided among his generals. Now that history, and again, if I've, I've lost you, come back. 
That history is not unfamiliar to us. If you have been here for this study, you've heard that same history repeated in Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, and now 11. So here's the question. What's the point? Right? You, this is an age when, when printed material comes at a premium. You don't have printers. You don't have word processors. You don't have erasers. Right? Printed material comes at a premium. So if you're writing anything down, it must be important. And if you're going to write the same thing down four times in increasing detail, it must be really important. So what is the lesson here for us? What is the lesson here for them? It's the one and the same. There is a lesson here about God and history. It's a simple lesson. A lesson that I've mentioned a number of times here and in 2 Samuel. It's the third theme of Hannah's song. The Lord is the Lord of history. That's a familiar lesson. And it's one of the most important lessons of the book. Daniel, as much as any prophet, is concerned about the world, the globe, and who's in control. And over and over again, we are reminded in all sorts of ways that the Lord is the one who's in control. Now, why would he remind us of this truth over and over and over again? Why would he remind them of this truth over and over and over again? Well, tell me, when do you need to know this truth? When do you need to know that the Lord is the Lord of history over the globe and over your life? When things are going well? Well, Maybe. But really when things aren't going well. Really, you need to know this truth when things are going terrible. When God's people are in exile. When the economy tanks. When you lose your job. When the diagnosis is bad. When God's people seem weak. And God's enemies seem strong. That's when you need to know. That's when you need to be reminded over and over and over again that the Lord is Lord of history. The Lord is Lord of this. The Lord is the Lord of global history and your personal history. And think about God's people hearing this in the 6th century. Think about Daniel talking to those exiles left in Babylon about what he sees and what this means. They are living under the rule of the Persians. And if you go back then and Daniel says, guys, I've had this vision, this is what it means. What does that mean for them? What does that mean for the exiles in Babylon or the new Babylonian city or Persian city that they're in? What does it mean for for them? Does Does this promise that God's people will once again regain political autonomy? Does this promise that they will once again occupy a more important place in world history and world events, like they did during David and Solomon's time? Does this promise that they will ever grow to become more significant, more powerful, more wise, more glorious than the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans? No. They will remain a conquered people. They will face certain and terrible persecution. When their king comes in Daniel chapter 9, he will be cut off and have nothing. It's a far cry from the wealth and power and the prestige of the Persian kings mentioned in verses 2 to 4 or the Greek king mentioned in verses 2 to 4. And that's why they need to be reminded again and again and again that the Lord is the Lord of history. This is a rainy day doctrine, you understand. God's sovereignty isn't something that, that people like us, Reformed folks or Calvinistic folks like us, want to fight about or debate about. This is something we cling to when the world falls apart. And It's a rainy day doctrine. It's a rainy day truth. It's something you need to know when things are at this worst, at the worst. You need to know that the Lord really is the Lord of history, even when history seems really cruel to God's people. That, I think, is a lesson we see here. We've looked at the Greeks and the Persians. Now let's look at the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, verses 5 to 20. This, by far, is the most difficult section of a difficult chapter. It's certainly the most detailed and maybe even the most instructive. Now, we could work through this line by line, this 150-year period, line by line, but I fear I would lose all of you, except 
the couple historians we have in here, and I'm not even sure I could hold your attention very well. So what I want to do is just summarize the history here and then think about applying it to us. So we're going to move quick. As we've seen and as you know, the Babylonians go down to the Persians, the Persians go down to the Greeks... The great Greek king Alexander has no children. When he dies, his kingdom is divided among four generals. You've heard those names before. I've mentioned them before. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Ptolemy, excuse me, and Seleucus or Seleucus. And the focus of verses 5 to 20 is on two of them, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, their dynasties and their wars. Now don't lose me, stay with me. The Ptolemies are based in Egypt. That makes them the king of the south. The Seleucids are based in Syria or Babylon, think Iran. And that makes them north of Judah, so they are the kings of the north. So you have the Ptolemies in the south and the Seleucids in the north. And what we see in verses 5 to 9 is the attempt of the Ptolemies, the attempt of the kings of the south, to go up and attack and make war on and defeat the kings of the north. They do this through military action. They do this through marriage alliances. Then they try military action once again when that fails. Then in verses 10 to 20, we see the kings of the north take their turn. In 5 to 9, the kings of the south make war on the north. Then in verses 10 to 20, the kings of the north make war on the south. They raise great armies. They head down south to Egypt. They win a series of victories. Then they set their sights on the coastlands, which in the Bible, the coastlands is the northern Mediterranean, Asia Minor, Greece, and Europe. But a commander, a Roman commander, will shut that down, and the kings of the north will falter. That's a general overview of what Daniel sees in these verses. After Alexander goes away, two of his kings, one in the north, one in the south, will fight each other, run up and down the promised land, get in fights, and nobody will win. Ultimately, the Romans, the king from the west, will win. So what does this mean for them and for us? Well, there's a lesson here, friends, about the Bible. Now, of all the prophecies, understand me, of all the prophecies in the Old Testament that trouble modern critics, this is the most troubling. And I imagine you can guess why. Because it is the most specific and detailed of any prophecy in the entire world. Old Testament. One critic points out that these verses refer to specific, historically identifiable kings. One notes 13 of 16 can be identified with great certainty in these two kingdoms between 322 and 163 BC. And if you have a study Bible in front of you, I imagine you can see down in the margins, oh, this is Ptolemy the third, and this is Ptolemy the fourth, and this is Seleucus the third, and this is Seleucus the fourth, all those sorts of things. Right, you see what I'm talking about. It's so precise. It's too precise, they argue. It's too precise. It must have been written after the fact. It must be an example of prophecy after the fact. Now, you've heard me talk about this phenomenon before. But I want us to think very quickly about the assumptions behind those claims. One of those assumptions we've already talked about. One of the reasons people say things like that is because they believe that if there is a God out there somewhere, He's not personal and He's not involved. Therefore, any claim that God speaks to men or reveals the history of the future must be rejected out of hand. The whole idea of prophecy, like history to them, is bunk according to henry ford now we've dealt with that objection before so i won't do it again but there's another assumption that controls that sort of critique and it's important so please listen to me the other assumption that controls that sort of claim that this is too good to be true it's too precise to be faithful the other assumption that governs that sort of critique is this the bible is no different than any other religious book And that the prophets of the Bible are no different than any other prophet we see today. That's the assumption, and that is absolutely and positively untrue. I invite you to go read the works of Nostradamus, and then go read Daniel 11, and tell me if there is a difference. There is a difference, 
And it's as different or as clear as night and day, smoke and clean air. The prophecies of Nostradamus are so vague and so general that they are capable of many contradictory interpretations that can be used to prove anything or nothing. Daniel 11 is not like that. It is so unbelievably specific that critics claim it had to be written after the fact. Nobody says that about Nostradamus because his prophecies are so vague, so contradictory, and have been proven untrue so many times. The Bible's prophecy is different than that. It's different in kind from Nostradamus. It's also different in quality. Take Mormonism, for example. Everybody here ought to know something. Every member of this church ought to know something about Mormonism. And do you know why that is? There's a Mormon church about three miles from here. And they claim that they're no different from us. They're just another denomination. And they tell unbelievers that we're just like Cleary Baptist Church. Believe that Jesus is my Savior. We have a Bible just like they do. It's the same Bible. We just added a couple books to it. Friends, don't believe that for a moment. And Mormonism's prophecies are very different than those in Daniel. Uh, Many of you probably know the name Joseph Smith. He's the founding prophet of Mormonism. He made the bold claim, the bold prediction, that in his lifetime, the temple in Jerusalem would be rebuilt in Independence, Missouri, in his own lifetime. There is no temple of Jerusalem in Independence, Missouri. Many people still follow his teaching. The second greatest teacher of Mormonism is named Brigham Young. And he made some bold prophecies as well. He made the prophecy that one day human beings would travel to the moon. He made the bold prediction that one day humans would travel to the sun. And do you know what they would find on the moon and on the sun? Mormons. Very cold Mormons in one place. Very hot ones in the other. He didn't make those claims. That would just have to be true if those were true. Now we've been to the moon. And we can see with telescopes. But I don't see a church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints there or any Pepsi products. There are plenty of prophets and there are plenty of prophecies out there, but there is nothing like this. The prophecy in the Bible is specific and it's accurate. No other religious book or religious text is like it. Not the Book of Mormon, not the Quran, not the teachings of David Koresh or Nostradamus. No, the Bible's prophecies are fundamentally different. And one day, you may wonder, one day you may wonder, hey, is what I believe, is what this is really different than what the Mormons believe? I mean, John Bunyan, if you read his autobiography, he was wrestling with this one day in the 17th century. He said, how can I be sure? How can I be sure that I'm not a Christian because I'm English and people in Utah are Mormons because they're born in Utah. How do I know that my book is different than their book? That my, what I believe God's word is different than what they believe is God's word? How, how can I be sure that mine is right and, and how can I know that for certain? And one of the ways you know that is through chapters like this. Remember Daniel 11. Remember that the Bible really is different than the Quran or the Book of Mormon. Remember Daniel 11 and its specificity and its clarity and its historical fulfillment. The prophecies of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Muhammad are so filled with holes and inaccuracies and contradiction that nobody bothers making the case that they were written after the fact. The Bible predicts historical events in concrete terms and gets it right, not just here, but everywhere. In Psalm 16, in Psalm 22, in Isaiah 53, and in Genesis 3.15. In other words, trust your Bible. There's a lesson here about the Bible and its prophecy. There's a lesson here about history. You know, you may not like the study of history, but what you believe about history is a critical part of your worldview. It's a critical part of the way you understand reality as you know it. See, history is not just about facts, people, places, times, dates. It is about purpose. It's about meaning. It's about goal. The dominant worldview in the West is naturalism or materialism. We'll talk about that weeks from now on Sunday night if you're part of that study. 
It's essentially the worldview of Darwinian evolution. And it goes something like this. This is what Darwinists or materialists or naturalists believe about human history. Humans evolved from lower orders of life into more complex orders of life. Humans evolved from less intelligent forms of life and are evolving into more higher, evolved, more enlightened, superior forms of life. They do that through education and technological process, and that's what history is. It is a history of less complex, less intelligent organisms evolving into something more, evolving into something greater, evolving into something better through education and technology. In fact, they argue that history is advancing towards a goal. That goal is utopia, a world in which there's no ignorance, there's no illness, and there's no inequality. That is naturalism's view of history. Things are getting better. We're moving, we're advancing not to Zion. We're not marching to Zion. We're marching to utopia. And that view of history is completely and utterly naive. Tell me, have human beings evolved much since verses 5 to 20? Have all the advances in education and technology moved us beyond devastating global conflicts, and pointless wars of conquest? Are we any closer to a world without ignorance, illness, and inequality? Who would say that we are? If you studied World War I, Henry's reading a book on World War I, I've become fascinated by it. On the Western Front, millions died. Millions died. And the battle lines never moved. For four years, millions went to their death. No progress. Have you thought about the outcome of World War II? Our enemies are now our allies. And our allies are now our enemies. For all the advances, friends, in medicine, education, and technology, which we should be grateful for, I'm not saying that, we have not evolved beyond Genesis 3. What we see in Daniel 11 is what we see in Genesis 3 and 4 and on the news every night. Estrangement from God, estrangement from other people, conflict, and lots of death. This chapter helps us think about human history and our worldview. 2,500 years of history have not improved human nature in the least. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus one night about human nature? He said, don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. We don't need an improvement. We need a new nature. We need to be born again from above. There's a lesson here about the Bible. There's a lesson here about history. And there's a lesson here about significance. What really matters from 363 to 150 BC? What really matters? Is it the kings of the south? Are they what really matters? These unnamed kings raised armies and fought wars, accomplished nothing? Is it the kings of the north? Are they what's really important? No. They remained unnamed, though they are easily identifiable. They invaded. They are invaded. They are defeated. They do some defeating. They raise powerful armies. They win some big victories. Then everybody is defeated by Rome, a king from the west. So who or what is ultimately significant? It's not the kings to the north. It's not the kings to the south. But it's the people of God. That's why they're mentioned here. They're the battleground through which these other kings do their fighting. They are sandwiched between them. One is to the north, one is to the south, and these armies march up and down the promised land over and over again, going to kill each other. When right out to the side, just right there within their touch, is the most important thing of all. The true God and His people and His worship. It's so close, they could almost stick out their arms and touch it. But so sadly and so tragically, these great kingdoms, these great empires, these great armies go up and down, up and down, fighting, killing, dying, when the most important thing in the world is right there. So close they could touch it, but they missed it out. They passed right by. That's a sobering thought. Right now, outside our door, people are doing that very thing. Not marching to war, not marching back to war. They're headed east and west on Cleary Road. It's 
some to the ball field, some to the lake, some to the restaurant, some to the grocery store. They think that's what matters. That's what really matters. And so week after week, month after month, year after year, they march up and down this land right in front of our church and other Bible-believing churches. The most important thing in the universe is right there. They could just turn off the road and come in and know God and God's people and God's salvation. But instead, they pass right by, heading north, heading south, going into a dark and futile future. Christian, do you see what matters? What really matters? It's not the Ptolemies, it's not the Seleucids, it's not the Romans who defeated them both. It is God and the worship of God and the people of God. See, there are no more Ptolemies, there's no more Seleucids, there are no more Romans, but there are still Christians. And becoming one by faith and repentance is the most significant thing you could ever do. We've looked at the Greeks and the Persians. We've looked at the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Now let's look at the first and the last Antiochus, or Antiochus and the Antichrist. So look with me at verses 20 to 35 and 36 to 45. These verses describe first the rise and fall of Antiochus and then the rise and fall of the Antichrist. And let's briefly go over these things because we've seen them before. Let's start with Antiochus in verses 20 to 35. You know this guy. You've met this guy. You know who he is. You know what he does. He's a Seleucid king. He wasn't in line for the throne. His brother's son was. After his brother died, he sort of skipped his nephew, took it from him by deceit, and made himself king. Then he made himself powerful through flattery, bribes, deceit, and double dealing, and mercilessly crushing all his opposition. When the Ptolemies, the kings in the south, came to mess with the kings in the north, he was one of them, the last of them, and he got mad. When they bothered him, he came down to bother them. He came down, took a big army, and beat them, and beat them soundly and roundly. But see, Antiochus is a bully, and he went home. But he wanted to come back to do some bullying again. And so years later, he leads a massive army from the north through the promised land down to the south. And when he comes to Egypt, he meets someone he doesn't expect, a Roman commander. And the Roman commander comes to Antiochus in front of his army and gets a stick and draws a circle around Antiochus in the dirt and says, before you step out of this circle, you need to make a decision. You either decide to go home or take on Rome. And so being humiliated, he stepped out of the circle and said, we're sorry, we're going home. Now a great bully like Antiochus is not going to take this sort of humiliation lightly, especially on his way back when he hears that Jerusalem is rebelling because Antiochus has been humiliated. So the great bully stops in Jerusalem to do some damage, and damage he does. That's the abomination that causes desolation. He attacks the city. He slaughters thousands. He desecrates the temple. He shuts down the sacrifices. He criminalizes a number of required religious practices like circumcision, Sabbath observance, and Levitical dieting. And he declared himself to be God and demanded to be worshipped as such. Some of God's people compromise with him. Others resist. And those who resist set off the Maccabean Revolt, which was named for Judas Maccabeus, the leader of the rebellion. In the end, the Seleucids were defeated. Antiochus dies mysteriously. God's people cleanse and rededicate the temple. But after all that, they still didn't win political autonomy or national sovereignty. The Romans took over, and they don't share power. The section ends with a cryptic verse, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined and purified and made white until the time of the end, for it awaits the appointed time. That's what God's old covenant people had to look forward to. Remember, they're looking forward, we're looking back. And the Lord clearly wanted to prepare His people for this event. He clearly wants them to know hard things are coming. And so He discusses it in chapter 7, 8, Nine and in remarkable detail here in chapter 11. Well, what, what does this have 
to do with us. After all, we're not going to live through Antiochus. This thing took place thousands of years ago. What does that have for us? Well, I think it has two lessons for us. Both of them important. First, not all suffering is discipline. Now that's something I think you probably get, but you need to remember this unique moment in redemptive history. See, up to this point in history, God's old covenant people were not strangers to suffering. They weren't. They knew about suffering. They knew about hardship. They knew about difficulty. But the issue is why? Think back to our study on Sunday nights, those of you who've been a part of it. Think back to what we talked about in Joshua and Judges, in Ruth, in 1st and 2nd Samuel. Think about what you see in 1st and 2nd Kings. Why did Israel lose the battle of Ai? Because Ai was too strong? No. Because of their sin. Why were God's people oppressed during the era of the Judges? Why did the Philistines retake so much of the land under Saul? Why was the nation devastated by civil wars under David? Why were God's people exiled to Babylon in the first place? There was a cause, and that cause was unfaithfulness. See, most of the hardship God's people have endured up to this point in time has been a result of unfaithfulness and disobedience. They disobeyed. They were unfaithful. God's prophets warned them about this, told them to repent. They refused to do so. Therefore, suffering. Therefore, hardship. Therefore, exile. Up to this point, all of the national suffering that Israel has experienced from the Exodus till now was a result of disobedience. Antiochus will be different. In fact, Antiochus will flip things around. See, God's people before Antiochus suffered because of their unfaithfulness. But under Antiochus, God's people will suffer because they are faithful. Friends, not all suffering in the Christian life is discipline. Some of it is, but not all of it. Sometimes God's people suffer for their unfaithfulness. But sometimes they suffer for their faithfulness. That was true then, that is true now. And the Lord tells them about Antiochus over and over and over again because he loves them and because he loves you. And he wants you to know about the world that you live in. That's why Peter will say, hey, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes. I want you to know about it, so don't be surprised about it. Don't remember what our Lord Jesus said. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Perhaps today you are suffering for your faithfulness. Maybe it's at home with a difficult spouse. Maybe it's at work with a difficult boss or co-worker. Maybe it's in your family as a result of your devotion to Christ. Friends, that is not unusual. That is not abnormal. The devil would have you believe that that was so which is why God reminds us over and over and over and over again that not all suffering is discipline. It's often faithfulness that causes it. And that's a typical experience for God's people. That's lesson one. Not all suffering is discipline. Second, beware of compromise. You understand there's always a way out of persecution. Almost always. There's always an open door, an ejection seat lever, a trap door, a way of escape. And the way of escape is compromise. And Daniel's prophecy here is clear about that. He sees this in Antiochus' day. He will seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. We see the same thing in the New Testament. We see the same thing today. I think that you probably get this, but let me just say it out loud anyway. You realize that you could compromise on maybe two to three things in the Christian life, in the Christian faith right now, and the world is totally fine with you. You can believe in a literal hell. You can believe in the deity of Christ. You can believe in salvation by faith. You can believe that the Bible is a good and healthful and holy book. That's not where the fight is so much. But if you're willing to compromise on the Bible's teaching on gender, you're willing to compromise on the Bible's teaching about human sexuality, then the world will leave you alone. But if you won't, if you refuse, 
then it won't leave you alone. As long as you compromise here, all is well. This is not new, you understand. Christians didn't get thrown to the lions because they believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Christians didn't get thrown to the lions because they believed that we're saved by grace through faith. They got thrown to the lions for one reason, because they refused to offer incense to Caesar. You do that, you can believe whatever you want. You know, our Protestant martyrs, same thing for them. All they had to do was profess really one thing, one truth. They had to say that the Mass is a real sacrifice. And no stakes, no fire. All our first parents had to do was just eat the forbidden fruit, and the devil would leave them alone. Friends, Satan doesn't attack us with many pressure points, just a few. Just one, two, or three. He'll tempt you to compromise on just a couple of things. Do you know where those points are? And have you made up your mind to take a stand on God's word? Beware of compromise. Well, we've looked at Antiochus, the first Antiochus. Now let's look at the last Antiochus, the, the Antichrist, one more time. I think I told Matt earlier today, I think I've said the word Antichrist more in the last three weeks of my life than I have in the rest of my life combined. Uh, I'm not someone, he's not someone I particularly enjoy talking about or preaching about. That's what my focus of my ministry is not on the end times so much as it is what the Bible says right in front of me in the book that I'm in. But right in front of me in the book I'm in, there's more Antichrist. And so we're going to talk about Antichrist for the third or fourth week in a row. So what is the Antichrist? Well, that's what we need to ask. What is Antichrist? Quite literally, he's someone who seeks to replace Christ as the king of the cosmos. We've said this before. I'll say it again. The prefix ante in Greek doesn't mean against. It means in the place of. That's what the Antichrist is all about. It's about one who would rule in the place of or instead of Christ. That's what is Antichrist. Someone to replace Christ as king. When is Antichrist? Remember what John said in 1 John 2, 18. Many Antichrists have come already. Antichrist is not just a future reality. It's a present reality as it has been a past reality. We've met past Antichrists. We've met people in the past who wanted to rule instead of Christ. Men like Cain, Nimrod, Pharaoh, Saul and Absalom. But the Bible's favorite example of an Antichrist is Antiochus, who we've been learning so much about. When Jesus wants to describe him in the Olivet Discourse, he goes right back to him. So does Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe. So if you want to know what the Antichrist is all about, who he is, what he does, please don't look to popular movies. Please don't look to popular books, but look at Antiochus through the eyes of Daniel and Christ and Paul. And what do we see of him in verses 36 to 45? We get one more glimpse of him in the book of Daniel. There's a clear shift I think you see, I think you get from the first Antiochus to the final one in verse 36. We're moving from an Antichrist with a lower A to the Antichrist with an uppercase A. We've already learned so much about him. He's a terrible blasphemer, a terrible persecutor, a great deceiver. But Daniel 11 ends on a different note. It ends not so much with his persecution, his deception, his blasphemy, but his downfall. Do you see that? At the end of time, things will be really rough. The Lord wants his people to know that. It will seem as though it's lights out for the church. God's people will be on the ropes. Evil will seem to triumph. The Antichrist will prosper. And victory seems to be at hand. But then something unexpected happens. Civil war. Look at verse 40. At that time, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall rush upon him. This is a picture of what the New Testament describes as the last battle. And the last battle doesn't go as planned, not for God's enemies. There's chaos, 
there's confusion, what, saw, what looked like it would be a overwhelming, crushing victory for evil turns into an all-out free-for-all among the ranks of the forces of evil. In the end, remarkably, to borrow from T.S. Eliot, the Antichrist goes out not with a bang, but with a whimper. As we see in Revelation, is it not? One of the most remarkable things about the ending of the Bible is it doesn't end as you might expect. As we get to the end of the Bible... And this great final showdown between Christ and Satan, between Antichrist and his people, we are expecting some huge pitched battle that will rage and roar, and God's people will squeak it out in the end. I think that's how we we expect it to turn out. But the Bible wants to disappoint you. The secret or the ironic thing about the last battle is that it's not a, a battle at all. The forces of evil array themselves against Christ and his people. But Christ shows up and destroys them with a word from his mouth. The end of history, the climactic end of history, turns out to be anticlimactic. Not because the Bible wants to disappoint you, but because it wants to encourage you. It wants to remind you that evil, no matter how real and profound, shall come to its end, and none shall help him. His allies will desert him, his wits will fail him, his plans and purposes will come to nothing. That is the end of evil. You know, history, according to Daniel, is not more or less bunk. It provides hope to God's believing people. The Lord is the Lord of history. He rules and overrules all things for his glory and the good of his people. Evil is real and powerful. The faithful will suffer for their faithfulness, but Christ is going to come to rescue his people, judge his enemies, and renew the world. As we come to the end of Daniel 11, I'm reminded of the closing verses of a great hymn, This Is My Father's World, and I want to end on that note. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget That though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let earth be glad. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for this special chapter of it. Lord, we thank you for the sweeping view of history we get from the book of Daniel. And now that we're coming to the end of that book, we we give you thanks thanks that history and the rest of human history should be a source of hope for your people, not one of despair. We thank you for the realism of your scriptures and that they remind us that things will not be easy in the short term, but they will be glorious in the long term. And so we pray that you would help us to serve on, suffer on, remain faithful, refuse to compromise. Help us to see what matters. Help us to see who matters. and Help us to love and trust him more. In his name we pray. Amen. Today we come to...